during this time, uh, leading the Department of Professionalism uh, with a steady hand during uh, challenging uh, few months, not only in our city, but in our community. Uh, also, I want to thank our City Council President, uh, Charlie Tenbright, and City Council President, C.C. Calhoun, for being on behalf of the City Council, by the of the uh, County Commission, Doug Singleton, as well, uh, many other uh, who are here today. We also have members of our command staff from Montgomery uh, Police Department, as well as our uh, Montgomery Fire Rescue. Uh, T. Jordan gives uh, his regrets for not being able to be here today, uh, but they are in Orlando doing the last step of the accreditation for uh, the Montgomery Fire Rescue Department. Uh, it's good to see our cabinet directors at the year, also, and I'm grateful uh, for their leadership special departments, as well as so many uh, members of the uh, Public Safety Committee uh, who helped us throughout this uh, transition, throughout the search, as well as members of our community, community leaders, uh, faith leaders, and business leaders who are here uh, at this time. Uh, December 2019, uh, less than 30 days after I uh, was elected as mayor of the city of Montgomery, I was selected to attend the New Mayor Seminar at the Harvard County School of Government. And they selected a handful of mayors to come up to uh, talk about the transition and talk about things that you only uh, learn apparently if you're a mayor. And they had several uh, former mayors as well as current mayors there who I think most were deemed successful in their tenure. And there was a lot of knowledge, a lot of personal wisdom that was shared. But one of the biggest takeaways that I got uh, during that symposium was that there are a lot of important hires, a lot of important decisions uh, that the mayor must make. But there's none that's more important than who you hire for your position. Uh, that's something that stuck with me because it was echoed by uh, several mayors, both current and mayors who had completed their tenures, uh, about the importance of that, and even relative to the chief of staff, uh, finance director, any other cabinet uh, position that was, people may seem to be uh, as important. And I took away something from that conversation because it just showed how much uh, importance people put on who is serving as your uh, police chief uh, and the importance of that person in leadership. And as it was said to us then, that person is probably the second most visible person besides the mayor to most of your uh, community. And because of that, this is something that we have uh, taken a global approach to selecting the best leader. Uh, that was our approach when we uh, announced the NRT Pairs as our panel because we understood the importance of that role and that's been our approach throughout uh, this process. Uh, while this process may have taken a little bit longer than we would like, we did not want to be held uh, captive to the calendar. We wanted to make sure that we got this decision right because we realized that public safety is uh, the number one issue in this community. That's the number one issue in my administration, and it's something that not only we hear about probably more than anything else, uh, the mayor's office, our city council, and many of our uh, supporters and many of our uh, informal advisors, if you will, remind us of those who are in the community who are hearing and, and leading change at a different level than where we are. And so I start with that backdrop because just last Monday, I got the opportunity uh, to take part in the National League of Cities Congressional Conference to speak with mayors, a uh, select group of mayors from around the country, New York City Mayor Eric Adams. Uh, Houston, Texas Mayor Sylvester Turner, Oklahoma City Mayor David Holt, uh, Jackson Mayor Shokwe Lumumba, uh, and so many others uh, that were part of what was a closed door panel. And it was around tackling violence and tackling crimes in the COVID era. And how uh, different cities, regardless of size or, or scope or scale, were dealing with that. And it was really interesting listening to our public safety co-chair of Ross Park, the mayor of New York, New Jersey, uh, and others kind of speak to some of the tactics they were using. Many of them talked about uh, wraparound service. We talked about community policing. We talked about uh, tactics that we 
having been implemented in the 21st century police and law. But without uh, getting into specifics, there was also uh, the need for us to talk about things to re instill confidence uh, in our respective communities. Uh, didn't matter what folks they were on, didn't matter the size of the city, uh, all were seeing and had seen an uptick in violent crime. All were trying to look for solutions a way to re instill confidence in a time when people were seeing more than 300% more information uh, in a day than we did just 10 years ago. And when most of that information is negative. And so when you think about where that puts people, it puts a level of anxiety and unease on people that uh, they already would have, but it just brings it more to the forefront. And out of those conversations, um, we share some solutions and things that we'll be releasing in a report uh, coming up very soon. But again, the conversation went back to leading our police departments and working with our community how to build that trust and transparency. And so today has been really a culmination of what has been searched for as best in class leader. And I think that um, we have found, uh, I firmly believe that we have a best in class leader. And that's not at the uh, expense of anyone who applied for this position, any other finalists uh, who we interviewed and came before our public committee, it just speaks to a uh, level of expertise and experience that we were looking for. And so throughout this process, uh, it has been more we have leaned on organizations like the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the African American Mayors Association, the National League of Cities, uh, bounced ideas off of the aforementioned mayor, Sylvester Turner, uh, Tampa Mayor Jane Castle, the only former police chief and, and major city mayor, uh, in office of this power, former Mayor City Benjamin, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, uh, Birmingham Mayor, uh, Randall Woodman, uh, Tuscaloosa Mayor Walt Mathis. And certainly I'll say that the last two, uh, because they were uh, probably most important, uh, one was a great one was indirect, and that is the Orleans Mayor of Toya Kentwell, who had very positive uh, statements about uh, our incoming police chief that had strong uh, statements about his leadership and his capability uh, in leading uh, in New Orleans from her time as a council member to her time as uh, mayor. And then today, I got the opportunity to uh, get an unexpected phone call as I was leaving the downtown YMCA. And I got a call from uh, an ex mayor or a former mayor of New Orleans, a former uh, lieutenant governor of Louisiana, and that was Miss Landry. And he called me, and I thought he was calling me because I was asking, asking him about some infrastructure money, Charlie, uh, and how we get our hands on some of that. But he called me uh, to tell me that I got one of his guys. And I told uh, Captain Alvin, it's not very often that a mayor wants to do a call uh, and say something um, unexpected or really unprovoked and say, you know what, you got to look And he was very positive about. Uh, Daryl Alperstein, uh, during his tenure, uh, two terms as mayor of New Orleans, and said, you guys are going to work very well together. Uh, your community is going to benefit, and you all are going to see a lot of positive things. And he also told me that uh, Daryl could have been chief of New Orleans, Louisiana, the NOPD. And he said, you know, he was in our finals group, and you, know, you have to choose one, you can't choose them all. And so it's also something for us, I think, that. Uh, Two former mayor, or well, former mayor and current mayor uh, of New Orleans, both speak very highly of your leadership and the service of you and your members at NOPD. And so I think that speaks again not only to the performance, but also to the character and to the leadership uh, that you have. And I did ask uh, former mayor Landon Trump if we could get our hands on the infrastructure money. And he told me that. He called me back and we can talk a little bit more about how we can go about doing it. So I could have let that call go without making an ask. Uh, but that said, it was great just to take that call from him uh, as he's now working with the Biden administration. Again, I, I shared with him that I didn't call him because I knew he was working with governors around the country about how to allocate the infrastructure dollars uh, through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. I didn't want to bother him, but for him to call, I think, said something again about uh, his 
testament to what you have done and the type of leadership that you all have uh, shown throughout your time in New Orleans. And so with that, I want to say that on behalf of our city and the residents here, um, we're grateful to have uh, someone like Daryl Allen, who has 32 years of experience in law enforcement, 15 of which have all served in the leading uh, SWAT team. He is an Army veteran with two sons, Daryl and Darren, and his wife Chantal, who is also a police officer with uh, the New Orleans Police Department. And most recently, Daryl served as commander of the NOPD Special Operations Division. He managed flight incidents, high risk warrant service, major emergencies and disasters, civil unrest, and more. He formerly served as deputy superintendent of MOPD for field operations and investigation and support bureaus. In this position, he is in charge of all of the police department patrol divisions, overseeing most of the agency's officers. When Darrell oversaw the MOPD major crimes unit, the murder rate in New Orleans was reduced drastically. As district commander, homicides dropped to a never before seen single digit year end reduction while increasing neighborhood engagement and modernizing his district. As deputy of field operations, murder dropped 65 in 2011 to 2014 by well over 25 percent. He's also a proponent of 21st century policing, promoting effective crime reduction strategies in tandem with building public trust. He knows how to bond with the community and bring together the partnership between the law enforcement and the community to make sure there's an understanding and everyone uh, also has a belief that they can work together. He's overseeing areas in New Orleans from garden districts to Calico projects. And so he's familiar with working with those who have um, the biggest bank accounts to those who have no bank accounts. And he's handling all of them in depth. He understands how to deal with large tourism uh, events. He understands how to deal with major disasters. He understands the inflection point that many cities are in right now and how they turn around into the post doors deployed environment. How we build that trust and transparency with grassroots leaders. And also how we make sure that we support our men and women in uniform. He understands that because his wife has almost 25 years of police service. Uh, his late brother also was a police officer, and he brings with that a law enforcement understanding. But understanding family is important to him as well. And hearing things from their side, their perspective, is very relevant to him. And so it's important as I could tick off a number of other accolades that we believe and we are confident that not only is he the right leader for this community, externally, but he's the right leader for this department internally. Uh, he stressed to me uh, the benefit in making sure that there's a deep base, and that you mentor young officers, and that you have the confidence of the officers in uniform, not just because you have the power position, but because they have the belief in your purpose. That's very important to us, because it's that type of commitment, it's that type of confidence that we not only need to have internally, but we want to have externally throughout uh, our city and throughout the district, the business community, the faith community, uh, the grassroots community, and those who feel disconnected uh, from our police department, not because of anyone's leadership, or not because of anyone's administration, but just because of things that they see here and do every day. He understands how to bridge that gap. And so we're very uh, excited to be here today. Uh, we're glad that he understands the importance of working with state law enforcement, the benefit, the potential of federal law enforcement partnerships uh, that we can maximize here in Montgomery, and the impact that has not only really on the public health of the community, but also the public wealth of the community. And so those things are, are very important. And so I just want to um, say that we are glad that the search is uh, now complete, that uh, they are here with his wife, Chantal, and his son was not able to, to make it, but also that we have, again, Energy Parish who has really stood in this brief for 
uh, a number of months and, and handled this uh, with professionalism all the way through. Uh, and that says something about her, and that says something about her commitment, not only to uh, the police department, but to the community as well. And so, with that said, this time, I'd like to introduce the uh, next chief of police for the Montgomery Police Department, Daryl Allen. Can't wait to get going. Can't wait for me to say it. Get going. Uh, Ramona Harris. 